morning is inner harmony. Inner harmony. It's a very important subject because we're all certainly searching for inner harmony and uh, sometimes it's very difficult to attain due to our own efforts in doing the things we shouldn't and laying up within ourselves habits, wrong habits. And so the subject might be curing addicts to mental habits or intoxication. That's all it is. We are the subject of habit, as we will see a little later in the discussion. You will remember words about Luther Burbank. He said how, how deeply ingrained were the habits of plants and how difficult to move them. Yet, with children or with us, it is not so difficult because God has given us free will and we are made in his image, and therefore we can eradicate those habits if we will. Much easier than if we happen to be of the plant family. So let us be thankful for that as we discuss this subject, and always bear in mind that the habits can be eradicated without question of a doubt, no matter how deeply ingrained they are. And so first, let us take an example of alcoholism, which is a deeply ingrained habit. We know the results of it. It's not necessary to discuss them, how, how a person's behavior to himself and to his family and to society is when he is in the clutches of that deeply ingrained habit. One thing we realize, that those who follow that habit or are sick, through the alcoholism, they do it to escape something. The world is too hard for them. The world is too difficult for them. So do not feel too much against them. They do that to escape the world. The only thing is, they escape, but there are after effects which are much too bad for them if they would only fight and overcome it. They can do it but they can do it usually only when they go to God. One reason why all the shaming and the reasoning is of no avail. Why? Because they remember the escape. Now understand that. They keep remembering that when they do that, follow that habit, they escape the turmoil of this outward existence, which is too difficult for them. And that's why even those who have other habits, just as deeply ingrained as this particular habit, they also follow that to escape something. By following that habit, they feel that they are better off, or they feel that they're going to be better. They feel different, but nevertheless it is an escape. And so, just the same as an alcoholic needs one thing due to his deeply ingrained habit. So do those people who have pernicious, pernicious habits of greed and hate and other things, sex, fear. They also need one thing, and that one thing is God. Because just as in the plant these things are deeply ingrained, so with us. The habits are brought up from childhood, as we'll point out in a moment. And they have made grooves in the brain, which are hard to eradicate. And sometimes it's necessary for one thing, God and God alone, to eradicate these deeply ingrained, intoxicating mental habits. That's all they are. They're the product of habit, and so it is well to understand habit. Now, ordinarily, we can prevent the formation of these deep-seated intoxicating mental habits if we will understand the law of habit. We will not become engrossed in habit to such an extent that it, it uh, commands us and we do not command it. So that's the important thing, is to first understand this law of habit. 
It is a very important thing, the power of habit. The power of habit is supreme in life. You may not think so. You may think, well, I do what I want to. No, you don't. You may think you do, but you just analyze yourself, and you'll find that you do not. As I always point out, especially going by the bakery. The old habit says, well, you haven't had a piece of that cake for a long time. And you say, well, I have full command of myself, but you get the cake just the same. <laughs> or the pie or whatever it is. And so it is well to understand this law of habit because it is supreme in life until you change the source of the formation of your habits. It is supreme in life. We do what we are, are accustomed to do. We do what we are accustomed to do. We do not do what we should do. Now, if we are accustomed to follow worldly habits, we do that, and in the end, the result is nil, nothingness, because that's the nature of this worldly existence. But if we are a child of God and follow those habits which arise from the presence of God within us, and we know it, and then there will be harmony within us. Harmony will reign because those things of spirit are eternal and lasting and of bliss, nature. The things of the world are not. They cannot be because that's their nature. They are of delusion and the end will be delusion and nothingness. And so if we understand this power of habit, then we can build in such a way that harmony will reign within us without question of a doubt. We must understand the law of habit. And so the battle of habit works both ways. That's one thing in our favor. Of course, on the side of evil, and we lay up a habit, it increases. And the evil increases, and we are subject more and more to that habit. But yet, when we turn and lay up good habits, which are based on the presence of the soul within us and the presence of God within us and the teachings of his great channels of light as our beloved master, then those habits work in our, for our benefit. They work for good just the same as for bad. But still, the habits springing from evil or from worldly consciousness have the first hold on us. That's the worst thing. Bad habits, for instance, they come early in life because we are not disciplined. Especially nowadays, the children are not disciplined in obedience, in consideration of others, in uprightness. And that habit becomes deeply in, ingrained, those habits become deeply ingrained so that it is hard to eradicate them. Because the habit formed in childhood persists. You know that. It persists and it is hard to be rid of them. Also, habits of society. Habits of society are not good. Society runs on the wheels of habit, does it not? Look about you. Well, right nowadays, habits of society means to live it up. Cocktail parties. And all those things. Those things form within the consciousness and brains of the young people, certain grooves, they are hard to eradicate. But one thing we should remember, and all should remember, that those habits which society lays up into us, in us, and the actions rising from those habits, society will not be responsible for. If following society you forget God in worldly living. Society will not take you back to God. Society only helps to take you further and more deeper in delusion and worldly living. That's a sad thing. Yet on the other hand, those habits such as those formed by coming to self-realization fellowship meetings, based on the presence of God in each and every one of us, if you persist in those, those habits will take care of you, 
so to speak. It will help you to establish yourself firmly in God. And so in society, following the habits of society, let us realize, let us be sensible. Just because 50 million people do a certain thing, and you know in your soul it's not the thing to do, are you going to do it and be a fool? Don't be that way. Stand up, even if you stand alone. As the Master used to say, give up this body if necessary to find God. And so let us realize if we are going to have harmony, and that's what we all want, we have to do something about these old habits ingrained deeply within us. We have to starve those habits. We have to starve them, how? By self-control. And remember, we're made in the image of God and we can do it. Don't depreciate yourself. Don't think that you are a sinner. You are not. You are made in the image of God. Due to his cosmic creation, you have been separate from him and therefore in sin if you want to look at it that way. But we have the power within us to starve those bad habits by self-control and also to feed the desirable habits, the good habits, how? By will and meditation. Those are the two main rules to remember. Try your best to starve the other habits which you dislike and which you know are not good for you. But you will, must reinforce it by meditation because meditation means concentration on God. And God is the one thing that everyone needs, especially those with deeply ingrained intoxicating mental habits. God can do it so easily. But the hard thing is to get into his presence. Because the habit is not to get into his presence. We have to, have to establish the habit to daily get into the presence of God. The habit of meditation. And in his presence, we will find, surging through a sufficient power to overcome everything. Because God loves us. Do you think he's going to leave us and forget us and cast us into delusion if we once show him that we want him? That's the important thing. And so, feed the good habits by regular meditation. Stab those undesirable ones by the exercise of self-control, which we all have. And remember, meditation gives contact with God sufficient to overcome the deepest ingrained habit, no matter what it is, such as God's power such is God's love for you and for me. We must approach it from that angle. It's God's love for us that does it. He created this universe of which we are a part through love. And he sustains it through love, although at times it seems that's far remote. That is not so. We do not understand the creation, the cosmic dream aspect. But God has done it through love. And through love for us because in the end, when we see him face to face, we'll realize how much he loves us and how much he really wants us to come back home to him. Giving us free will, he has given us the choice to accept or reject him. And now another important thing about overcoming these undesirable, deeply ingrained habits is environment. Environment is very important. Environment must be understood, thoroughly understood. And if you are bothered by these deeply ingrained habits, intoxicating habits, change your environment. Change your environment. Why? The better to stab out the old ones and to feed the good ones. You make up your mind to do better and then you go right directly pell-mell into the same old ruts that you were in. You cannot overcome that way. Change your environment. Environment is stronger than willpower until your will is one with God's will. So change your environment is very important to remember. Now, in environment, the law of gravity and habit plays an important part. It's a law of gravity. If you mix with bad people, you're going to develop 
evil habits. You gravitate to that way of living. If you mix with worldly people, you will develop worldly habits. Now you may say, well, worldly people are all right for me. Yes, that's right. They're good, honest people usually. But there's one thing they lack, and that is they do not feel the responsibility of knowing God. They do not feel that responsibility, and that we must have. If we have the responsibility of knowing God, even though we have deeply ingrained habits, which we are ashamed of, God will pull that person finally to him. Because God is not mocked. And finally, if we mix with people of meditative habits, those people dwell in the consciousness of Christ, of God, and the saints, then your habits must be better. Such an example are the people in Self-Realization Fellowship in this meeting at which we are attending. Everyone here, I am sure, feels the pull of God, otherwise they wouldn't be here. And the more you stay in this environment, here and at home, and the different meetings of Self-Realization Fellowship, the better you will be able to starve those already laid up bad habits and feed the good habits of such communication and such merging together in the presence of God. These things are sensible, common sense. Let us realize that. Now I have just a reference to give you at this time concerning company. Taken from Master's teacher's little book, The Holy Science, about company. Company is very important. As to company, he says, here also, if we listen to the dictates of our conscience and consult our natural liking, we will at once find those persons whose magnetism affects us by cooling our system, cooling down our system, internally invigorating our vitality and developing our natural love, and thus relieves us of our miseries and administers peace to us. These people should form our company. You know yourself, you mix with some people and the battle begins. The restlessness starts and you feel jittery all over. That's not good for you. Don't mix with that kind of people, those kind of people. On the other hand, some people, you come into their presence, you feel a cooling sensation. You feel just like a gentle breeze coming over you from some goodness. Those are the people with which we should mix. They help us. Calmness is so important. Master said to me one time, he said, never lose your calmness. Saints never lose their calmness. Why? Because the whole psychology is upset when you mix with those people who irritate you. So mix with those people who have a cooling effect upon you. And then your whole psychology will change. And especially if you couple that with regular meditation and devotion to God. And so company is very important. Environment is very important. Now comes another thing. Another point in changing your deeply ingrained habits is diet. Diet is very important. Certain diets, such as meat eating, and other foods, beef and pork especially, what happens? When you eat those things, there's toxin remains in your bloodstream. This is a scientific fact. It's not just my saying it. It has been shown that there are about 30 or 35 percent of undigested particles of the proteins of flesh foods that is not digested. Where, did it, where does it go? It floats around in the bloodstream as a toxin, and it gravitates and causes all other diseases, many other diseases, to come about. And so it is important to do away with that, because those deeply ingrained grooves in the brain are accentuated, so to speak, by the formation of these toxins within your bloodstream. 
so that it makes it more difficult to eradicate those grooves in the brain. Let us understand that one thing, diet plays an important part, especially meat eating and faulty elimination. Where does it come from? It comes from the toxins in the bloodstream. While on the other hand, a diet made up mostly, or a good part, of fruits and vegetables, dairy products, and such things, and also followed by fasting one day on fruit juices a week. Not ten days, you don't need to do that, but just be satisfied to do one day on fruit juices is very helpful in eradicating these conditions in the brain which have been established through the formation of these habits, intoxicating mental habits. So there, remember just those two things. Cut out the eating of those things which lay up toxins within yourself. They only help establish those habits which you are trying to eradicate. Follow it rather by a simple diet on fruits and vegetables, plenty of fruits and vegetables, and dairy products. If you feel once in a while you have to have flesh food, keep away from those two things I have named and have other things. It's much easier on you. will not lay up the toxins in your system. Those things keep irritating us. You know when you can't eliminate how you feel? The whole world seems, as the Englishman says, rotten. Well, it's only because of that simple thing, but it's a fact. If you stay away from that, eat better, eat properly, and then you will not feel that the whole world is rotten, which is conducive to the establishment of these undesirable habits within us. So, so much upon diet. Rather a diet, natural living plus a diet made up of vital foods, as I have said, the fruits, grain, vegetables, dairy products. Those are natural, vital foods. And one other thing to remember, which are not irritating to you. Some people can eat a barrel of raw food. If I did, I think I'd die right off. So be sensible. Have those foods which you can digest, which your digestive system can handle. And so natural living and the proper diet plus exercise and greatest of all, plus meditation. Those are musts to establish harmony within you by eradicating the different deeply ingrained habits. They are simple <coughs> rules. Natural living, right diet of vital foods and one which is not irritating to your particular digestive system exercise plus meditation. Somebody gets started on a new habit, a diet, fad, and someone wants to try it and they can't digest even the things they're eating now. So they have trouble. Sri Yukteswarji was a great exponent of common sense and I'd like to read from his little book once more, The Holy Science, about diet. Just a few simple things about diet in eradicating these habits within us, these deeply ingrained habits, and reestablishing within us harmony, which is our birthright. And so he has this to say about natural living on a non-irritating diet. That's the most important thing. A diet which is suitable for your digestion and my digestion, not somebody else across the street but for our own requirements. A lot of the trouble comes right there. We do not eat according to the ability of our digestive system to digest it and assimilate it. A very important point. So let us see what Sir Chesterji has to say. He was a very wise man. And I find great help in reading from his little book, The Holy Science. He says this, one thing I forgot to mention is that if you do this, if you follow a natural diet, non-irritating, you will not have to go to extremes such as asceticism and monastic living, which is impossible for most of us. It's not necessary at all. You'll be perfectly well and healthy if you'll obey these few simple rules. And so he says, we find again that extraordinary means such as excessive fasting, 
scourging, monastic confinement, and so forth, when they are resorted to for the purpose of suppressing the sexual passions, but in vain, in vain, as these means seldom produce the desired effect. It is not necessary. Experiment shows, however, that the man can easily overcome these passions, our enemy of morality, by natural living alone on a non-irritant diet, above referred to, and thereby they get a calmness of mind which every psychologist knows is the most favorable to mental activity and to a clear understanding as well as a judicial way of thinking. So do not think you have to go off the deep end, but just remember the few simple rules which he gave. Then he goes on to say, various fruits, grains, roots, vegetables, nuts, dairy products, and for a beverage, milk and pure water are decidedly the best natural food for man, which being congenial to the system when taken according to the power of the, of the digestive organ. Remember that. That's very important. Some of you can take certain raw food, some cannot. Be reasonable. Watch and see what you can do and then do it. And so he says, if we do this, these things become easily assimilated. That is, no toxins floating around in the bloodstream, making you feel down and out, depressed, faulty elimination. It will not occur if you remember the four simple things. Natural living, proper diet, non-irritating diet, exercise and meditation especially is the important thing. All things besides these are unnatural, not suited to the system, and are necessarily foreign to it. So there we have wonderful words of wisdom from Sheer Tesuji, who gives us, in a few words, the important things about diet in reference to the overcoming of these deeply ingrained habits. We must make a start, let us start right there, along with environment, to overcome these habits. And so finally, finally, if we want to establish within us inner harmony, establish the habit for God. I know a master once said to me, he said, I know you found out as I found out that the greatest thing for overcoming everything is meditation. That's true. Because if you meditate and feel the presence of God, you'll automatically do these things I have been talking about this morning. And as God is bliss, you're bound to have inner harmony if you will just make the habit of daily, not putting it off, daily contacting him, feeling his presence. And so that's the most important thing perhaps this morning is to establish the habit of God, the habit of meditation. Another important thing is this, refuse to dwell on your weaknesses. Don't dwell on them. Don't go around telling everybody how you feel this and that, don't do it, don't dwell on them. You are not that, you are not your weaknesses at all, neither am I. I have plenty of them, but I don't acknowledge them. What are we? We're children of God made in his image. And as such, we do not have to acknowledge those things. Just because he has placed us in this land of delusion, and through mire and delusion, we are subject to these different things, the formations of these different habits, that doesn't mean that the habits are us, or we are the habits, no. We are children of God made in his image. That's what we must remember. And if we realize that, then we will not acknowledge our weaknesses. We will not feel, oh, I'm a sinner, condemned to hell and all those things. Forget it. You are not your weaknesses. You are God's child, just as we all are. And so, if you form the habit of meditation daily so that you look forward to it, and then, in his presence, when you're in his presence, throw yourself at his feet. He will give you sufficient strength to overcome any habit. 
No matter how deeply ingrained it is, such is the grace of God, such is his mercy, such is his love for us. We do not understand God's relationship to us and our relationship to him. If he loves us, and all the saints say so, those who meditate deeply know so, then why not trust him a little more? Why not give ourselves to him, do our best, and then let him take over? And he does it so easily and so nicely, it is a great pleasure and a great joy. And so, alone we can do nothing. Alone we can do nothing. You've seen people with deeply ingrained habits. They're just victims of them. That's all. Addicts. But I've seen the presence of God go into them, and I've seen them change completely. Why? Because God's love for his children, and for you, and for me. Alone we can do nothing. But when God comes into us, and his love comes into us, all things are possible according to his will. Let us remember that. One more reference from our Master's book, The Master Said, which is a beautiful reference I'd like to give you at this time. It is beautiful to think that the Lord loves all of us equally. Even the sinner in the gutter, God loves just the same as the saint sitting on high, so to speak. That's how wonderful God is. The Master says it most beautifully. It is beautiful to think the Lord loves us all equally. But it seems unjust, said one visitor, that he should care as much for the sinner as the saint. But doesn't that make God much greater in our eyes when he loves the sinner that is down and out just as much as the saint? I think I love him better for that. Then he goes on to say, is a diamond less valuable because it, it is covered with mud? Is a diamond less valuable? Because it is covered with mud? God sees the changeless beauty of our souls. He knows. He knows we are not our mistakes. And so let us take heart in overcoming the things which we all have to overcome. Approach it in a sensible way, but the most sensible way is approach it in God's presence. He will do it. He will do it easily if we can but do that and make that effort. And so harmony must and will reign. In a harmony will reign if somehow we can overcome the habit which has kept us separated from God. That's the greatest habit we have to overcome. Separateness from God. Apart from God. One great saint said, Knowing God's love, you have life eternal. Harmony eternal. Not knowing his love, you have death eternal.